Hello, everyone. Can you guys hear me? Hello, hello. Okay, yep. Hi. Hello. Hi there. Hope you guys had a great day today. It's around nighttime uh, in India. Uh, it's uh, morning for me. I'm in Toronto. So, yeah, hope you guys are uh, still awake and uh, have en enough energy to learn Web3. Uh, so my name is David, um, and I'm the CTO and founder of Uniblock. And at Uniblock, we create a unified API for fast blockchain development. So um, throughout this week, myself and Depesh from Bill Bear, uh, who has been building in blockchain for the Depesh past five from years, Bill Bear, will be uh, who uh, is teaching you to introduction of blockchain. Um, if there's any questions and stuff uh, after the lecture, like you can go to Discord and, and ask them. And throughout the stream, I'll also be looking at the chat uh, and uh, pausing in the middle somewhere and asking you guys uh, for if you have any questions or need any clarifications of what I'm talking about. So let's get started. All right. So uh, right now, Web3 is pretty big. Um, a lot of people come from the Web2 industry, where, where it's uh, full stack development, front end development, back end database. But there's an extra layer uh, that's Web3. And I'll explain what it is um, and how it's impacting the industry. So these are the topics we're going through today. What is blockchain? Uh, blockchain solution to current world problems. Blockchain's evolution. The Ethereum network, consensus mechanisms, blocks, accounts and transactions, smart contracts, the DAP tech stack, and I'll show you some example use cases. So first of all, what is blockchain? Uh, blockchain is a decentralized and distributed digital ledger technology that's uh, shared amongst a computer network. And for those of you who don't know what a ledger is, um, it's a record keeping system uh, like you can think of it as a book that collects uh, everyone's accounts and tracks their financial statements made at this date or whatever. So blockchain is just a decentralized version of that. What does that mean? Uh, well, if you think of like an accountant, the accountant, that one person or that one company will maintain the records of your transactions. Um, but oftentimes those records can have mistakes um, and when you ask for those records, maybe you have to email them and they'll respond to you within 24 hours, which is not exactly convenient. Decentralized means everybody, uh, in the network will share the same copy of, of those records. And if one of them, uh, makes a mistake or reports false information, well, the other 99% will say, Hey, that's a mistake. And therefore there will be no, uh, discrepancy in the data. So traditional ledger, if you guys don't know, it looks something like this. Uh, yeah, you have some kind of numbers recording what you have and uh, the date you spent or deposited. Uh, yeah, you have and some you keep recording in a chronological order. Well, blockchain ledger is similar. So of course, there's a bit of different information. Uh, we'll be talking about blocks and data about those blocks. But it's, in general, it's chronological order. And it tells you uh, what, uh, how much money or Ethereum or the currency you've spent and what happened during that transaction. So what are the current world problems? Uh, well, there's many, there's many world problems. Um, if you guys have been keeping up with the news, um, if you heard of Silicon Valley Bank recently has been bankrupt um, because they overinvested in government bonds and the uh, interest rate went up and they couldn't maintain liquidity. Uh, but the people who deposited money into SVB did not know that. And they're in a quite a bit of a, a scare when that happened. Uh, that's because they couldn't withdraw their money for uh, quite some time. And it was a, a big unknown, but the, eventually the government bailed them out. But uh, it should not happen in the first place. Uh, the consumers should know if their money is secure in their accounts. There's three major banks in USA that has uh, bankrupt uh, this year. 
which is not not a good sign uh, for our economy. Um, next is censorship and data integrity. Uh, recently, the governments across the world have been, and also organizations like Twitter, uh, have been trying to censor uh, some information that they deem is harmful to the public. Uh, in 2017, Turkey banned Wikipedia, which is huge because Wikipedia, as we all know, contains a lot of information that people need to know. But for political reasons or whatever else reasons, uh, Turkey decided to censor it. Uh, but with Web3, uh, people uploaded it to uh, the, the decentralized web and the government no longer can control uh, the data because the servers are not centralized. So there is no one company that is hosting the data. The third one is middleman costs. Um, so whenever you try to buy something uh, or do some kind of financial transaction, you will most probably ask a middleman to help you um, unless you're doing it to peer to peer. Uh, for example, you want to send money from USA or Canada to India. That is a cross-border transaction. Uh, you'll probably go to some website, uh, Western Union, maybe wise.com, uh, and send that money. Uh, oftentimes, these middlemen will take a percentage or a, a fixed rate to pay themselves uh, to conduct that transaction. But with blockchain, you don't need to do that uh, because blockchain, the code on the blockchain will be the middleman and you just directly send uh, money from one wallet to another wallet. And it actually happens pretty quickly, maybe within a couple seconds, and that will be inside your wallet already. The government cannot block you uh, from doing it because it's decentralized. Um, and the rate that you pay is a couple of dollars to send quite a huge, month, huge amount of money. <clears throat> Next is traceability and authenticity. Uh, right now, there's a huge market for fake goods, uh, especially like companies like Louis Vuitton. Uh, people love Louis Vuitton bags or Gucci bags or Supreme bags or Supreme clothes. Um, and it's very hard to tell if the fake goods is real or not because factories have gotten pretty good at making high quality fakes. Uh, well, if you have those uh, goods recorded on the blockchain, well, you can now trace back to where this good is produced and if this good is already sold and who owns it. If it's somebody already own it and and they, they cannot provide you a proof that this is real, well, chances are it's going to be a fake product. <clears throat> Financial inclusion. So there's a lot of um, people in the world that do not have the opportunity to be banked uh, because their community is deemed too low income. So the infrastructure does not uh, does not reach there. But with blockchain uh it's decentralized so there is no it's open to everybody to join in uh, and get a wallet and hold their currency there uh there's actually a lot of applications and also companies that are working on web3 uh, financial products for the end banks in africa next is data ownership have you guys been looking at YouTube recently? It's been filled with AI music and also AI pictures. Um, well, if that happens, if I make a music video with a celebrity's voice, well, that celebrity might be missing out on income, right? And also, uh, how do they enforce the rights to their voice? Uh, well, and a good solution here is you make some kind of digital asset, NFT, and you sell it to people. And the people who bought the NFT will have licensing to your voice. So that in that way, the artists can still maintain ownership uh, and the profits of their own voice. Uh, next one is voting fraud. If you've been keeping up with the USA elections, uh, Trump has been saying that there is voting fraud happening uh, in the U.S., uh, and that's because there, a lot of people are still counting paper ballots. Uh, they've also been using machines, but it's on centralized servers. Um, they can be hacked and they can be tampered with. Uh, well, if you put on the blockchain, you will see that it, these votes cannot be tampered with. And uh, it's 
open data for everyone to see. So you can't really uh, call voting fraud uh, when the data is that secure and that open. So blockchain is providing a lot of solutions to the current world problems. Um, these are just a few that I came up with. But uh, since we're in the early stage of Web3, more and more companies will discover more problems and also discover more solutions with blockchain. So let's go through the history of blockchain. So first, uh, there's blockchain 1.0. Uh, it's just the first concept of decentralization. Uh, it's cryptocurrency focused. And there's emergence of cryptocurrency wallets, uh, mining rigs. You've heard of people mining Bitcoin. And uh, yeah, so Bitcoin is from uh, Bitcoin 1.0. Oh, sorry, blockchain 1.0 era. Um, all it is, it's a decentralized ledger. It keeps track of everyone's balances. So it says uh, this person has 100 Bitcoin. This person has five Bitcoin. This person has transferred uh, one Bitcoin from his account to another account. And all the computers store the same giant file that records everyone's transaction in chronological order. So uh, because of that, I can easily send money to somebody because all I'm doing is editing the ledger. Like, hey, uh, I make a transaction and send it to this person. There's no one company holding it. Everybody that has a mining software will process that transaction. And then next was blockchain 2.0. Uh, so instead of just having a ledger and uh, like recording people's balances, why not have ledgers of data transactions? So you can even have code uploaded to the blockchain and now you can, uh, you can execute code in a decentralized way. I can upload my code and I can let you run that code and you run that code to interact with somebody else, and it's all free. That code cannot be taken down, and uh, yeah, it's open source. Um, there's a mass adoption of decentralized applications because of this concept. If people can upload code for everyone to use, then everybody else can make an app on top of that code. Uh, that's already been audited, security tested, and uh, there's a business model that has been figured out. Um, if there's a successful company, I can also copy that smart contract code and twist it to my flavor and re-upload it to the blockchain as well. The good thing about this is there's no downtime. Um, so, and there's no company behind it. So there's guarantee that this smart contract will exist and work forever. Assuming that the code uh, has no uh, backdoor or uh, pausing mechanism in there, of course. So Ethereum is the first one that did decentralized smart contracts uh, made by Vitalik Buterin in 2023. And uh, there's a decentralized exchange project called Uniswap that I'll explain more later on by Hayden Adams in 2018. <clears throat> um, okay, so more on Ethereum. Uh, so it's the first decentralized blockchain uh, with smart contracts. It, it runs on a Ethereum virtual machine. What this means is a lot of different nodes or computer, you can think of them as little processors and little databases, and they all contribute their processing and storage power uh, to make this one giant Ethereum virtual machine computer. Uh, imagine your own computer has processors and storage and stuff. But instead of just you having it, everybody shares their own. Um, of course, people are not doing this for free. Um, whenever you make a transaction on blockchain, you pay in Ether. Uh, it's a cryptocurrency for Ethereum. And you pay in Ether, and this is called a gas fee. So whenever a node processes a transaction, you get paid in gas fee to compensate for your electricity and equipment and stuff and services. <clears throat> Right now, it is the largest adopted blockchain for decentralized applications and has the largest community support. And Solidity is the most popular coding language for Ethereum. And here, you can look at the statistics. Um, so this is from DeFi Llama, and it's been taken in uh, 2022. Uh, Ethereum has over half the blockchain market, and that's where most of the money is. 
Uh, although some of them, some new chains are picking up as well, but uh, Ethereum is still very, very dominant in the market. So that's why I'm going to choose to focus on Ethereum uh, throughout this lecture. Okay, so this is a Ethereum network. Each of these nodes communicates information between each other. So whenever someone makes a transaction, one node will receive it and it will propagate the data towards the other nodes until all the nodes knows the data and are in sync. These nodes are called validators uh, in Ethereum and they used to be called miners. Uh, and also in Bitcoin, they're called miners. Slightly different, but uh, don't worry about it for now. They receive data, that's their job, and um, they add new blocks of data to the blockchain. <clears throat> I see some questions in the uh, in the chat. What is Ethereum and Bitcoin? Are it different or the same? Uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum are two different blockchains. So if you, if you remember what I said here, uh, Bitcoin is decentralized ledger, just keeping track of people's accounts uh, and how much money they owe. Um, and Ethereum is a decentralized uh, blockchain with smart contracts where you can upload code to the blockchain. So you cannot, it's very hard to make uh, decentralized applications with blockchain, but it's very easy to make decentralized applications with uh, Ethereum. And most of the Web3 developers are built uh, or building with Ethereum. <clears throat> if this is secure, what well, about cyber jobs? Um, well, it's the blockchain itself is secure, but the applications on the blockchain uh, might not be secure because someone is still writing code for it. Um, how about Solana? Well, Solana, uh, that's a bit advanced. Uh, let me get into that later on. Okay, consensus mechanisms. So in blockchain, um, all these nodes have to communicate with each other but they also have to agree on the information that's shared. So let's say maybe five nodes say, hey, this person's balance is actually five Ethereum. Um, but then another person say, hey, this first person's account is 10 Ethereum. Well, how do you agree which information is correct? That's where uh, consensus mechanisms come in. So there's two main types, two main popular types of consensus algorithms, proof of work, which is uh, you do math to solve uh, a puzzle in order to add the next block to the blockchain. If you cannot solve this puzzle, the block will not be added. So this was the uh, mechanism for Ethereum 1.0 and also the mechanism for Bitcoin. You have to constantly run the machine to solve mathematical problems uh, uh, for there to be consensus met. Next is proof of stake, which is what Ethereum 2.0 and Solana, if you're benching, uses. Um, they choose randomly a validator or a node in the network to add another block. If the node uh, puts out wrong information and the majority agrees that this node put out wrong information, uh, then money or Ethereum that is staked, which is put inside a node, will be taken away from you. So if you are a node, you cannot just start a node and become a full node in Ethereum. You have to put up 20 Ethereum to guarantee that you will be putting out correct information. If you're not, your money will be taken away from you. Um, Ethereum itself, because there can be code added to Ethereum, um, they can constantly upgrade as time goes on. Um, here's the roadmap. Uh, they're trying to add the beacon chain. Uh, they're trying to merge. Oh, I think they 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 merged it already. Uh, and sharding is the next big one. Oh, beacon chain is already out. Sorry, sharding is the next big one. Um, what sharding wants to do is uh, they want the cap the the capabilities of your machine requirements lowered to a point where you can just host a node on your phone. Uh, so then there's be more there'll be more computing power. Okay, um, how does blockchain work? Well, I've been saying you add blocks to the blockchain, right? What is a block exactly? So this is a block. A block has uh, the the body, which is the data of each, a lot of transactions, 
Uh, don't worry about Marco Root. Uh, the timestamp is the time that the block was added. Uh, the nonce is a security thing. And the main thing you should know is the hash of the previous block header. What is a hash, if you don't know? Uh, well, hash is kind of like encryption, but not really. A hash, you, can, you take in a string. You take in a string or a number or an integer or some kind of data, and it outputs a random jumbled string. It's always a fixed size. So if you, even if you have input a long string in, it will, for example, output always a 256-bit hash string. Different from encryption, you cannot decrypt a hash. You can only hash one way, but you cannot uh, reverse it back to the original value. So if I hash the block header I and I get the, the hash string, I don't know what the actual block header is. Um, so how does it work? Well, every single block will contain the hash of the header of the previous block. And it keeps going on and on. Now let's say someone uh, changed the data on the blockchain uh, at block uh, n minus 50, right? Then all of the blocks after n minus 50, inclusive of n, n uh, minus 50, will have a wrong hash. And all the other nodes will know that this node is uh, outputting false data. Therefore, this is tamper resistant. Okay, so there's Ethereum accounts. So I've been saying accounts and identity, but uh, what is it actually? Uh, well, EOA um, and smart con smart contracts have this zero x something 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 long string that's unique to yourself. Uh, when you ask for people to send you cryptocurrency, this is what you ask them. Hey, send cryptocurrency to this address because this address is representative of my account. Uh, so an EOA, um, external owned account, uh, is generated using ECDSA. Don't worry about what it is. It's just what the mechanism is uh, to generate these, these accounts. These accounts are actually generated from a private key. So it's actually another long string. And this private key, uh, you can do a lot of things with it. This private key is very important because if you lose this private key, people can take over your account. And when people say uh, they lost their account or lost their money on uh, on blockchain, that's usually the case. They have somehow exposed their private key. This is, by the way, an example private key. There's no money on it, so don't uh, don't bother <laughs> uh, accessing it. Um, yeah, so Ethereum address will be derived from the private key, and uh, you can send money, and you'll be identified uh, with this address. Private keys can also sign pieces of data. Um, here's an example piece of data, which is a transaction. Um, you can actually sign anything. Once you sign it, uh, there, there'll be a hash. and But from the hash, you can derive which address has signed it. So it's kind of like signing a contract and sign your name on it. I can always tell who signed this piece of data. Um, okay, there's some questions. Can you explain once what happens when we try to change something to a block, the whole scenario of the mismatch? Yes, so I actually just went through that. So if you change something at block minus 50, n minus 50, um, the hash, because, because all of the blocks contain the hash of the previous block, um, if you change it, then all of the following blocks will have the wrong hash. And when you have the wrong hash, uh, everybody else can clearly tell that this node that's telling us that uh, false data about a block, uh, well, he's he's malicious or uh, this block is not trustworthy. So that block's uh, information will be rejected from the network. Hmm. Okay, so for these private keys, well, you don't have to remember your private key. Of course, that's a very long uh, string that's jumbled. There are decentralized applications, such as wallets, uh, that manages your uh, private key for you. It manages it on your client, on your computer. It never leaves your computer. It doesn't go to any server. 
Uh, this is because nobody else should know what your uh, what your key is. Only you. Never share your key with anybody else. Uh, and then there's also something called a hi hierarchical deterministic wallet, an HD wallet for short, that can generate a key ring. Uh, so this one key spawned from a mnemonic phrase can spawn different uh, private keys on the road as well. Uh, the most popular wallet right now is MetaMask. Okay, let's talk about transactions of blocks. So uh, when you make a transaction, you're actually moving from one state to another. Kind of like if you use React, you update the states. This is what happens when you make a transaction. When you make a transaction, you don't directly put it into the blockchain. You put it into a transaction pool first, and then the nodes will read the transaction pool and decide which one to add to the block. How do they decide? Well, of course, it's it's money. Uh, if you offer a higher amount of money for a miner to or a validator to add to the blockchain, of course, they're going to choose yours first. And that's what happens uh, when you see gas prices going up and down. The more demand there is, uh, then the higher the price people are offering and uh, the more gas each individual has to pay on a, in a, on a on a average basis. <clears throat> Uh, okay, so what are the types of blockchain there are? Well, there is public blockchain, which is Bitcoin Ethereum. It's permissionless, and anybody can access this blockchain, okay? Um, and the other one is private blockchain. Private blockchain is for individuals or organizations that don't want to share the data with the public. Um, they want to only share data with a set amount of companies or authorized participants. So for example, uh, Hyperledger, uh, who uses Hyperledger? Uh, let's say supply chain, supply chain companies. They want to talk, let's say Walmart wants to talk to some kind of farm company, manufacturing company. They don't want to expose data to other organizations uh, because their supply chain is very cheap. And if other organizations offer at a higher price, then um, then they'll lose their business, of course. So they want to keep their data secret, but they want to keep their data still have some sort of integrity. Uh, so they invite only a set few. So maybe they invite a manufacturer and farmers and textile uh, manufacturers as well, and also distributors into, into the node network. Okay. Next is the blockchain trilemma. So there is security. Oh, okay, there's a question. What about consortium blockchain? Consortium blockchain is just private blockchain, uh, what I described. Uh, private can be a single company operating it, which usually isn't the case. Um, and consortium is just inviting other participants. Uh, privately. Okay, blockchain trilemma. So different blockchains solve different problems. And no matter how good the blockchain is, the current thing is blockchain trilemma. If you choose to have more decentralization, you have to sacrifice either security or scalability. If you want more scalability, you'll sacrifice decentralization or security. If you want high security, then you sacrifice either decentralization or scalability. So if you look at Bitcoin, uh, well, they want to be decentralized, but it's not very scalable. Same thing for Ethereum. Uh, Hyperledger, uh, well, that's centralized, kind of. It's private. So they want security and scalability, but no decentralization. Uh, VeChain wants uh, decentralization and security, uh, sorry, and scalability, but they have authority nodes. So uh, if authority node gets hacked, that will be a big problem for security. Uh, okay, so next, uh, what is a smart contract? A smart contract is just a piece of code you upload to the blockchain. Uh, in Ethereum, it's called the EVM. So let's say you make a function, right? Let's say you make a function in Node.js. You have to host a server and some somebody have to ping the server to access that function and they get the response back. 
Well, you don't have to do that anymore. You can upload your code to the blockchain and the blockchain just hosts it. And anybody can just ping the blockchain for data and functions. Uh, you don't have to host your own server. You don't have to manage anything about the server. Just simply upload your code. Uh, your smart contracts has these properties. Uh, not, extens it's not, not exhaustive, but uh, smart contracts can also have their own address and they can own money. In this case, Ethereum. Uh, the smart contract has data state, so you have variables in there, but the variables are initialized with some kind of data, um, and they're stored there. And of course, the code of the smart contract. Here's an example of a smart contract. This is Solidity code. Uh, it looks very familiar, smart contract. similar to this is Solidity code plus Java. Uh, uh, you have your constructors uh, contract. You can think of as a as a as an object uh, or a class, and you have your functions in there and variables that you can declare. Some questions here. Uh, what does scalability refer to in a blockchain? Scalability is the amount of transactions you can add to a blockchain at a time, uh, and also uh, how much data can the blockchain store and uh, t transactions per second and the volume of it. Uh, next one is, is if it's decentralized, then where is the server located? There is no central, everybody's computer contribute to the server. Uh, it's a blockchain network, not, it's not one single computer. It's multiple computers and any individual can host it. Okay. Uh, so yeah, so this is the example of smart contract and Actually, all these cryptocurrencies you see on Ethereum, well, not all of them, but most of them are ERC-20 tokens. And a token is just functions. Specifically, it's just these functions. If your smart contract has these set of functions, it is a token. It is considered a token. Um, if you have the name, if you have the total supply, if you have the balance of, and you can transfer it, if you can approve somebody to transfer it, all of these will make up a token. So for example, USDC, USDT, Chainlink, Shiba Inu, uh, recently Pepe tokens, uh, Curve tokens. You can make them yourself. You can make your own personal tokens if you want to. It's actually quite easy. Uh, as long as you implement these functions in your smart contract. I'll get more into it uh, in a bit and I'll teach you how to make your own as well. <clears throat> and so this Solidity code will translate into uh, uh, machine level code, assembly code. <coughs> and these assembly code will have an associated gas cost to them. So let's say if you want to do an addition, uh, then the gas cost is three. If you want to multiply, uh, the gas cost is five. Okay, sir, please tell the prerequisites for Web3. Uh, well, uh, maybe this can answer your question. Right now, uh, most of the world, we in Web three we call these people Web two developers. Uh, Web two developers, full stack developers. Uh, there's front end, which can talk to the back end, which can talk to a database, right? And these may be some of the tools you're using. So on the front end, you use React, uh, use SAS for CSS, use Axios to do HTTP calls, and use Storybook to do testing, right? Um, and on the back end, maybe you use Express JS. Uh, use Prisma uh, for database communication. Use Open API to let people call your REST API. And for your database, maybe use Postgres SQL or MySQL uh, to host data. Well, for decentralized applications, there's another layer where it's a, where it's blockchain. The front end can directly interact with blockchain without the back end. And the backend can keep in sync with blockchain data by just communicating with the, with the blockchain. And the backend can communicate with the database as well uh, to do whatever. Uh, but if you notice, you don't really need to communicate with the backend. Uh, you can communicate directly to the blockchain. That means if a company shuts down or something something's wrong with the backend, you don't need it. If something's wrong with the front end too, uh, and the front end gets shut down, well, anybody could just host another front end to interact with the blockchain because the blockchain code is never down as long as the blockchain is up. 
Uh, so right now there's two tech stack for blockchain. One is Ethers.js, one is Web3.js. Uh, Ethers.js, uh, well, you need this library to, is a JavaScript library. You can, you can interact with the blockchain with it. Um, use React and you can install Ethers.js on it and use MetaMask as a wallet to interact uh, as on behalf of your private key. Um, the blockchain will have its own coding language and framework, Ethers, hard hat, solidity. Uh, backend can also use Ethers.js. Database remains the same though. Um, there's also Web3.js. Uh, you just replace Ethers.js with Web3. And there's Ganache and there's uh, the Truffle Suite instead of hard hat. So if you're going to choose between them, um, well, Ethers.js has, uh, it's better for code readability. The package size is way smaller and it's much more tested than Web3.js. But Web3.js has been here for a long time. So uh, the community, there's more support for it. And there's more tutorial materials. There's a lot of YouTube tutorials and there's a lot of articles explaining how to use Web3.js. Although Ethers.js is catching up on, on this as well. Okay, uh, questions here. Who authorized this token token functions? Um, it's just it's just your code. It's your own code. Uh, you can code it up in the way that you want to. Uh, I'm not quite sure what authorized mean. Um, you can in the functions if you want some some con some accounts like only specific accounts to manage it, then you can. Um, if you want anybody to to interact with it, you can. So anybody can interact with the token. What's the role of the miners? Uh, well, it, it goes a few slides back. Uh, the miners add new data to the to the blockchain. Um, scrolling back here, so these blocks, how you when you make transactions, you add new data. Who adds new data? Well, the miners will add new data for a fee that you pay. But like, so for example, if you want to upload a smart contract to to uh, Ethereum, well, a miner or a validator will help you do that and they charge a processing fee. Okay, back to here. How to audit smart contracts. Um, well, how do you audit code in general? You have to have experience in computer security. Um, and uh, you need to train yourself in or educate yourself in uh, auditing uh, security practices and also white hat hacking and stuff. How much we should know? Okay, that's a general Web2 question. Um, know, know how to code. Uh, I don't think this is a good course if you don't know how to code, no. Okay, uh, some popular decentralized applications out there, uh, as for example, finances and payments. Well, there's Uniswap, where it's decentralized exchange. Well, if you guys want to trade in a stock exchange, you have to trade it on a centralized exchange, and you have to sign up for accounts and provide your ID. Well, on decentralized exchange, you don't need to do that anymore. So Uniswap, here, I'll give you an example. Uh, here, this is Uniswap. And you can choose to swap from Ethereum to uh, USDT. And because this runs on a smart contract, you can connect your wallet and just trade with the blockchain. And it just edits the balance of your, of your, uh, of your account. Uh, next is Aave, uh, which is a borrowing and trading, uh, borrowing and lending platform. So, Normally, you would go to the bank to borrow some money to do whatever you want. And you put up some, some collateral, like your house or your car or some asset, your wedding ring, some asset. Uh, well, with Aave, you can now borrow money or lend money to people um, uh, throughout the world. So if you, if you want to lend money in India to somebody in Africa, you can do so. And you earn an interest rate for doing that. So using Aave, you can deposit your money here and you be lending out money and you can withdraw it at any time. And if you notice, the interest rates are quite high, actually. Uh, 2% for supplying and borrowing, you get 3.52%. By the way, you can, this is a 
front end on top of uh, a blockchain. So if you want to, you can build your own applications on the same smart contract and make your own uh, bar lending platform quite easily. Next is yield optimization. So when you do yield trading, uh, well, you can do leverage trading and stuff and you earn a quite a high amount of uh, interest rate. Of course, there's a risk to it and you're trusting other people's uh, strategies to do so. Uh, but you can earn like a yearly interest of 12% or 10% if you uh, if you use these yield trading uh, uh, strategies. So you just deposit your co coins in there and it'll automatically earn money for you. Of course, there's a risk and you should do your own research for every pool. Uh, stable coins. What is a stable coin? Actually, a stable coin is just a a cryptocurrency representing fiat currency. Fiat currency, for example, USDC is USD. So one USDC token equals one USD. How does that work? Well, let's say I make a company and you can give me $1 and I will, on the smart contract, uh, mint a token for you. Say uh, uh, this account has $1, one USDC. And then you can give that USDC back and I'll give you your $1 back. So that's a stable coin. How is that useful? Well, if I have a stable coin, I can just transfer the stable coin to somebody else anywhere in the world without anybody blocking you and pretty much instantly. Um, I just click send this person and then click send and then I'll the, the, the wallet will interact with the blockchain, the blockchain will edit the data. Maybe like three seconds, you're done. Uh, and there's no fees in the middle. The only fee you're doing is the, is the fee you're paying to the servers, which is a couple of dollars. Uh, Next one is uh, trading virtual assets. Uh, if you guys heard of the NFT hype uh, recently, um, you can make artworks and you can sell them as an NFT. And you can trade it on, on OpenSea, which is a very big NFT trading platform. Uh, this is great for artists and people in arts in general because uh, the, the problem was data ownership. And when you sell the art, people can easily just print it out with no proof of ownership. But with NFTs, you can now have proof of ownership and just show everybody that you actually have the proof. Uh, and the next is Axie Infinity. Uh, actually, let me, uh, actually, maybe I shouldn't show Axie Infinity, but it's a, it's a game where you can play and you can earn currency, cryptocurrency for playing that game. And you can buy and sell in-game characters for cryptocurrency as well. So you earn money while playing the game. Next one is Nexus Mutual. So Nexus Mutual is a decentralized insurance platform. So let's say uh, you are you're doing beefy, right? Beefy finance. Uh, and you don't know if the smart contract will get hacked or not. What happens if it gets hacked? Will I lose all my money? Maybe, yeah. Uh, but you can buy insurance of it. And this insurance is decentralized insurance. So general people will pool into yeah, add money to the pool with cryptocurrency and uh for doing so you'll earn an interest on that cryptocurrency and whenever a hack happens that pool that mo that money in the pool will be taken away to pay that person up to 90 percent and you get anybody can buy it and unless uh although this company itself is is a bit centralized uh, that they do take your ID. Well, you can all you can easily make a decentralized version of uh, such a platform. The goal of this is to take away a lot of the middleman fees that uh, insurance insurance companies usually have, and you get way better rates as well. What can we do in this? How can we earn from this? Uh, if you're talking about, well, I'm teaching how to become developers uh, in Web3 and you can build a lot of these apps yourself or work for a company to build these apps. How do you earn from this as a trader? Well, I don't give financial advice, but if you want to uh, put money uh, into it, so you can you can put money to a pool and you earn an interest rate uh, from Nexus Mutual. Okay, um, you can discover new uh, projects from CoinGecko. Uh, CoinGecko is here. I'll show you CoinGecko. CoinGecko is a list of different tokens, and these tokens usually is a 
uh, is associated with some kind of project as well. So if you want to discover more, you can click into it and read more on it. Okay, um, next you want to try out new dApps. You want to try out, uh, maybe I don't have money to pay for Ethereum. Uh, I, I don't really know if I want to use dApps to be honest, so I don't want to invest in it. But you can try it out actually with fake Ethereum. So what you need to do is go to MetaMask.io and download the Chrome extension. And then what happen is you have a wallet on your, on your browser. And that browser wallet will manage your private keys. You can generate new ones if you want to. And then you switch the network to Sepolia network. So there's different networks within Ethereum. Um, different networks is actually a separate blockchain, but MetaMask can handle different ones. Sepolia network is a test network. So it's fake. It's a fake blockchain. Uh, people can manipulate the blockchain if they want to. They can, they can mess up people's balances. The purpose of it is just to for testing. And uh, because it's a fake network, uh, you can go to sepoliafaucet.com and you can paste your, your address in there and you can tell it, hey, please send me uh, free Ethereum or free money. And they will send you free money to test. So you can use the test. And you can pay the miners uh, this Ethereum for gas fees. And you can go to test versions of websites uh, such as Uniswap or OpenSea. And you can start buying and trading tokens for free. Okay, and next you can deploy your own applications, decentralized applications, and also your own blockchain. So Uniblock, which is the company I'm building, uh, is a unified API to abstract away these repetitive logic for your DAP development. As you can tell, there's a lot of information you have to, you have to re retain uh, in order to do DAP development. But uh, at this stage, we are trying to make it way more abstract so you don't have to know all of these minor details for you to, for example, make a token. Um, and Depesh, which we'll also be teaching tomorrow and throughout the week, uh, he's the founder of BuildBear. And what they can do is easily deploy a private blockchain. Uh, and it's convenient for you to use it for testing smart contracts. Or maybe you want to host your, your own blockchain as well. So for your homework, your homework today, um, if you want to deploy your own token, you do not need to know how to code using Uniblock. So what you do is go sign up on Uniblock and go to the smart contract page and you click on ERC20 token and you can deploy your very own cryptocurrency as well, very easily. And then you can have that cryptocurrency in your MetaMask wallet. And now you can send people your currency <laughs> if you want to. Uh, you can sell it if you want to. You can make the currency have value if you want to. Let's say... Uh, you can have a have a David token and you can give me 50 David tokens and I will tell you a joke or something like that. Maybe give me 50 tokens and I'll drive you somewhere. <laughs> you can easily make this token and uh, if you want it more seriously, you can make that token for a business, right? Your business can now have its own currency. Uh, In-store credits, uh, it could be a digital currency too. So to summarize today, um, what we've learned so far, uh, we talked about peer-to-peer -peer network, which is like directly sending data from one node to another, they communicate with each other. We talked about the data layer. Uh, there is a blockchain and the, because the blocks have the stores, the previous hash, um, you cannot manipulate it. And if there's a manipulation, the rest of the chain will be, uh, will be um, falsified, right? It will be destroyed. Um, next is a consensus layer, which we talked about proof of work and proof of stake. Proof of work, you mine, you do mathematical uh, calculations to reach consensus. Proof of stake, you put some money into your node. And if your node is outputting wrong data, your money will be taken away. Incentive layer, well, why would miners work for you? Well, of course, they'll take some Ethereum as gas fee or some Bitcoin as gas fee and they'll be earning money on doing so. <clears throat> um, we talked about contract layer, which is smart contracts. You can upload your code to the blockchain uh, and the code will be living there for as long as the blockchain lives. And you can interact it. You can build a business on top of uh, someone else's code as well. 
up to you. So it makes things open sourced and repetitive work not uh, not a thing anymore. Um, and then we talked about the application layer, the use cases. We talked about uh, gaming. We talked about insurance. We talked about uh, stable coins where you can send money from one wallet to another. Uh, application layer is, I think, what most of you will be building on. So there is a limitless permutation of blockchain applications that have not been made yet. Right now, it's a very early stage uh, of, of Web3, and we require new people like you guys uh, to come up with new ideas and build businesses on top of it. And for the new businesses, they'll need uh, developers to help them uh, build out this application as well. Actually, right now, a lot of corporations are looking into Web3 and need Web3 talent. Uh, so there's a lot, actually a lot of jobs in Web3, uh, and it's a hot skill to learn these days. Okay, so that will be the end of the lecture. Uh, I'll give uh, next three minutes for questions, if there's any. I think there's some previous questions I didn't uh, I didn't answer. Which stacks will you teach us in this course? Uh, well, throughout this week, um, we'll teach you Solidity and uh, EtherJS, how to build smart contracts. I'll also introduce you to Unilo oh, sorry, Uniblock and also BuildBear. Uh, how, how does that make your life easier as a web free developer? Uh, if you want to go back to the, uh, the stack page, it's it's this one. Miner's data is cross-checked by whom? It's cross-checked by other miners. So let's say five miners say, hey, uh, this is the real data. And the other 99% of the miners say hey, that's not real data. Well, uh, it's democracy. So the, the majority rules uh, in terms of the uh, the, the data. Is this bootcamp enough to get a, a entry-level job in Web3? Um, the bootcamp itself, well, at least for this week, uh, we'll teach you the basics of blockchain. You'll have to learn a lot other stuff on your own as well. You have to make your own projects and build out your own apps, of course. Uh, you can't just get a job. Well, maybe you can, uh, but more chance of you getting a job if you have experience uh, in your portfolio. Can you share this presentation? Yes, yes, I can. What is store in previous hash in the first block if there's no pre previous block? Oh, that's actually called the Genesis block. Um, it's just, there's just nothing. I, I think it's null depending on the blockchain. Any prerequisites for the course you're looking for? Uh, for this Web3, you have to know React and you at least have to know Node.js and uh, maybe SQL. Uh, because if you don't know full stack, you can't really do full stack blockchain development. That's correct. Thank you, Karthik. Correct, correct. Any documentation you suggest for getting more knowledge? Uh, yes. So if you want to learn even more, uh, the best place to look at is the docs. If you go to Ethereum docs in Google, uh, if you go to ethereum.org, this website contains most of the basics you need. If you read through these, they also offer tutorials as well uh, that you can go through. Um, which is hot or trending? Um, they're both hot and trending. Uh, depends on what flavor you like. Um, there's more, I personally prefer ethers uh, because I, I find it more code readable and the package size is smaller. It's well more tested. Sometimes Web3.js has functions don't work very well. It just tells you it works this way, but it doesn't, uh, which is quite annoying. Uh, but a lot of other stuff, uh, Web3.js has more functionality uh, than ethers.js. So it depends on you. There's also more, uh, to, uh, more materials to read on for Web3.js. What do these Bitcoin wallets like bind? What? Get in. 
I'm not understanding the question. The Bitcoin wallets like Binance get in profit. Uh, Binance is not a Bitcoin wallet. Uh, Binance offers Bitcoin wallets, but it's not actually a wallet. They just store it for you. Um, they're an exchange. So every time you trade, they take a percentage of the trade. What are we going to build this week? Um, we will build a, a cryptocurrency website uh, for you to fundraise. Okay, uh, well, I think that's it for today. I'm running out of time. Uh, if there's additional questions, um, you can ask on the course Discord channel. And tomorrow, Depeche from Bill Bear will teach you about Solidity and how to actually write a smart contract and deploy it. Okay, um, I, I also encourage you guys to check out Uniblock and Build Bear and try to deploy your cryptocurrency tomorrow, uh, before tomorrow, so that you understand uh, what it is. And it's pretty cool to own your own cryptocurrency as well. All right, thank you very much. I uh, hope you guys learned a lot today. Uh, and I'll see you guys again on Thursday. Be sure to attend the, be sure to attend the lecture as well tomorrow. Okay, bye-bye. Have a nice day.